Hello potential backers and friends, this is Jason Duffley, developer of Heroes and Hardships by Earl of Fife Games. Um, today I wanted to show you um, the very basics of our Heroes and Hardships dice pool system and how that works and a few options for it. So you can get a idea of what happens when you make a skill check. Um, Primarily, most of what you will do in Heroes and Hardships are make skill checks when you roll. Um, there are also uh, times you might roll on a table uh, for wounds and surges and things like that. Now that is not that doesn't constitute a skill check necessarily. And then there's some other there's other rolls that have skill checks in them so like if you make a death roll which is um, you know if you're gonna die or not in certain situations you make a skill roll but there's some uh, modifications to that roll that make it unique to itself um, regardless skill rolls are probably 90 percent of what you're gonna see um, this is a d10 dice pool system uh, we've taken inspiration from such legendary games as Seventh Sea and Legend of the Five Rings, but there's quite a bit of uh, nuance to the um, system where that uh, it is not uh, the same at all. Uh, just they ha there have there have similarities, but they're not exactly the same. Okay, uh, let's look at. Uh, we have a troll here. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to show you a couple things um, on the character sheet. This is a Roll20 character sheet, which is available um, for everyone. Um, okay, what you have here is you have our, our attributes. So let's look at the strength. That's four, okay? And then the skills, or I'm sorry, let's look at endurance is four. And let's look at the skills under endurance, okay? So you have recovery, resilience, and stamina. We'll just do recovery. So the way... Um, dice pools work in Heroes and Hardships is you add your skill and your attribute together to get the number of rolled dice, uh, rolled D10s. Uh, you make that roll and you keep your attribute um, number. So in this case, it's a four. So we're going to roll, if we do a recovery roll, we would roll six D10 and then we would keep four of those. Okay, so let me show you in practice how it works. I'll just roll it and we'll see the um, the results. So we got a 34 and it has a nice, interesting way that it shows this that we can see. Okay, 60, 10, drop 2. 2 is our recovery skill. Um, if you look at the results, you'll see it was an 8, a 17, a 7, a 2, a 2, and a 2. Well, how do you get a 17? Well, in instances where you are trained in a skill, which means you have a skill rank, the dice is said to explode. That means if you roll a 10, you roll another d10, and then you add that to the previous die. And that can continue as long as you roll 10s, uh, which can give you some uh, varying results. Okay, so here you have your 34, you have six die were rolled, and uh, four were kept, one of them exploded, so we rolled another die and got a seven, and so we have a 17 on that die now. Okay, that's how the rolls work, the basic rolls work, it's very simple. Um, so you have a, a total of 34 here. There are some things that can alter your rolls. Uh, there's a concept of uh, a benefit. A benefit comes when you do certain things or you have an advantage. Uh, a really good example of a benefit use in Heroes and Hardships is an, the aim action in combat. When you use the aim action in combat, based on how many action points you spend, you get a benefit. So if I'm using a gun and pointing it at someone, or even if I'm doing a melee attack, I can aim. Um, when I aim, each time I aim, it gives me a benefit. So benefits add to your rolled dice. So if I had a benefit in this situation, in recovery, instead of rolling six dice, I would roll seven. However, however I would still keep four, and that's a benefit. Another thing that happens uh, potentially is having a static modifier. This static modifier can be positive or negative, uh, and this happens um, as you're rolling the dice. So if I rolled this 6d4, keep 
4, I would have, maybe I have a static modifier of a negative 3. A negative 3 is something you'll see often in Heroes and Hardships, particularly for injuries, which apply a negative 3 penalty to all your rolls. So if I make this roll and I got a 34, but I had a negative 3 penalty, instead it would be a 31. Um, the last main thing that you see that can alter um, your dice and how they work is something called a hardship. Hardships are a sort of penalty dice and there are various uh, types of penalty dice in the game. Uh, a hardship is one of them. You can get them for taking wounds um, and doing other things. This is actually a modifier to the difficulty. Um, or you can actually just subtract it from your roll. It really doesn't matter which way you do it, um, but it can be either. Um, if we subtract it from our roll, what a hardship is, is instead of a static negative three, you roll a D10 and you subtract that result from your result. Um, so let's say if I had a 34 and I rolled a D10 and got a seven, then instead I'm going to have a 27, okay? Um, now the thing about hardships is they also explode. So it's possible I would get a, a negative 20 on one dice. Um, so it, it does have some variability. That's why wounds are so impactful in this game uh, and other penalty dice as well. And so uh, they can be quite variable. Um, so that is uh, basically our dice pool mechanic that I wanted to explain to you today. And that's how it works in Heroes and Hardships. I really hope you consider backing us and uh, thank you for your time. Hello everyone, potential Kickstarter backers and friends. This is Jason Duff, the lead designer of Heroes and Hardships, and this video is a character creation tutorial so you can see how a full character is made through Heroes and Hardships. Our character creation system is simple yet deep with hundreds and hundreds of options for abilities, ancestry traits, flaws, skills, and so forth. I think that you're really going to like it. Um, and I want to show you exactly how it's done here. There are two methods for character creation in Heroes and Hardships in the core rulebook. These are point by and roll. Uh, the point by is a system where you get a certain amount of attribute points and you assign them to the attribu attributes um, that you like. The roll system is you roll on a table and that determines your attribute score for each of your attributes in order. Obviously one gives the player a lot more flexibility to create the characters he wants or she wants and the roll system is definitely more uh, random uh, in nature. Some people like that and some people want to have full control so that is up to you. However you want to do it, you can. If you look at the character sheet here, and this is on Roll20.net, we have a full character sheet that you can use if you use virtual tabletops and Roll20 in particular. If you look on the left side of the character sheet, you will see the attribute lists. They are grouped in physical, mental, social, and fate. Uh, these are the attributes that you will use to build your character. Um, we're going to do the point by system uh, just for ease of use uh, for now, just so I can show you exactly how it works. Characters are built with points based on the power level of the game. You see here, power level 2 is what is selected. On power level 2, you get a certain amount of points, um, whereas in power level 1, you get less, and in power level 3, you get more. Uh, these points can be uh, allocated to your attributes um, pretty much any way you like except a few rules. In this example we are using the fate attribute which is sometimes not used and that attribute can go to zero where everything else needs to be at least one. This example we're going to make an assassin. So I'm going to change the attributes uh, around to a total of 36 points, which is what you get for a power level 2 character. 3 in Strength, 5 in Agility, 5 in Dexterity, 3 in Endurance, 
How about two in intelligence, two in knowledge, four in senses, three in willpower, two in presence, three in empathy, and two in communications, and one in influence, and one in fate, giving him one fate point uh, remaining. Fate has uses for magic and for extra things that help your character later on. So we're done with attributes. The next thing we're going to do is go to skills and modifiers. Here on the character sheet you can see the skill groups and this is, has all the skills in the game um, when we open some of these uh, attribute groups. Um, the way this works is you add up all your attributes and in each group and that's how many possible ranks you get for the group as a whole. Um, so if your attribute total is 16 like it is here in physical skills then that's how many attribute ranks you get to um, add uh, when you're filling out your skills. So we can start with physical skills here and let me open up agility and dexterity. Um, as an assassin uh, there's probably certain skills we want to focus on, like stealth. So let's give him four in stealth. So that's four skill points that I've used of the 16 total that we have. Um, I will give him what else? Let's see. Uh, small blades, so short swords, daggers, things like that. So that's eight of the 16. And then um, dodge. Dodge is crucial for um, evading things like incoming attacks. So that's another four. For a total of 12 ranks, the ranks are kept right there. Um, so easily seen on the character sheet. Uh, resilience and stamina are good. Uh, they have very specific uh, uses in the game as well. So we need two more. Let's do acrobatics. That would fill out all of the physical skills that we need. Let's shut those down and move on. Now we have mental skills. We have a total of, let's see, uh, it looks like um, four, eight, 11. 11 attributes, so we're gonna get 11 ranks. Three in perception and three in reaction. That's six of the 11. Uh, what else should we pick? Um, we have, let's see. Um, in willpower, let's do fortitude and courage, one each, that's eight, so just a couple more left. Um, and then we'll look at uh, some other ideas here, lore, it's like a knowledge-based skill, kind of a catch-all, and survival, uh, that brings us up to ten. Uh, that is ten of the total that we had. So we get one more. How about healing? Uh, kind of uh, helps us do some first aid. And that would be all with mental skills and we can move on to social skills. Social skills, uh, looks like we have uh, eight here total. So um, let's look and see what our options are for skills and, uh, while I expand them, okay? Um, acting is uh, kind of like a disguise. Uh, it can be used for that. So let's do one there. How about one in read person, or two in read person, and two in streetwise? And um, how about two in deception? Now, there is something to understand is when you um, spend the skill ranks that equal your attribute, it costs one additional. So this actually costs me three skill points instead of two skill points. Um, and that happens when you meet the attribute that governs the skill, so two and two. Uh, that does not happen when you have a one and one, however. These are just some case corner um, rules. Uh, fate is the next thing, and you can see that there's only one skill called focus. Focus is magic based, and what happens is uh, you have an extra fate point if you don't have any fate sk or focus skill. Therefore, you have one extra skill point that can be put somewhere else not in the fate skill category. So this is done at one to one, doesn't cost anything extra like it would normally. Uh, normally when you uh, spend a physical skill point in a mental area, it uh, actually costs double. So what should we do? How about just athletics? We'll put it in athletics and then we're ready to go. So now that we have skills all finished, the next step is to calculate characteristics. 
characteristics are a type of attribute that uh, is derived from skills and your attributes. So you can see all these on the right side of the screen uh, here. Uh, size and speed is not a part of the derived attributes. So uh, you looking, we'll go to defenses here, 26. Hmm. So that will uh, that is a combination of several of the attributes and a couple skills. Um, magic defense eight, mental defense fourteen, wound level sixteen, and then injury level eight, mortality threshold thirty two, terror level fifteen, fear level goes to seven, and insanity threshold is thirty. And the last thing is wound threshold of two. When when I I'm going to do a video for combat as well, and we'll get more into those details later. Uh, next though is our abilities and ancestry traits. There are hundreds upon hundreds of abilities and ancestry traits uh, and flaws uh, that you can use in your game uh, and for your character. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to purchase them. Uh, I purchased them based on our skill ranks. So if you look here, you see 17 physical, 11 mental, and 7 social, and 0 fate. There are groups in the abilities and ancestry traits uh, that correspond to these groups. There's also a general uh, group and a fate group that you can uh, spend in. The general group you can spend uh, as if it was one-to-one. -one. Um, so if you have physical skills, you can uh, spend it in any category, uh, or I'm sorry, in the general category. Now, uh, I'm not going to pick any ancestry traits uh, for simplicity here. That would just go along with, say, human, and a human would get eight a eight potential ancestry traits that they can choose. Um, and so that goes for any ancestry in the game uh, or any that you should create. There should be eight of them that is available to players based on that trait, based on their ancestry. So here I uh, have just shown you what I have taken. Um, they each have a cost and that goes against the physical, mental, or social um, pool that you have. I have wary, read in the wind, keen one, literate, and others. And these come out of different pools. Um, for instance, read in the wind is mental and so is wary, um, but and keen and literate and mental conditioning. So uh, the, these come out of the different pools, the physical, general, or social pool. And um, they do different things, right? Some um, increase your skills, some give you advantages in certain situations, like hard to hit, for instance. You add one plus your power level, so that's a total of three, to your base defense. That's one thing that that does. A lethal weapon adds two to your damage. So now I'm going to go up and I'm going to change lethal damage up to 29 um, because of hard to hit one actually increase that stat for us. Okay, so the next thing in character creation is really getting into the character um, that you're playing. Um, not so much your stats, uh, but now um, what we what we said we are actually in uh, what I would call uh, step seven. So determine your background. Who is your character? Okay, uh, who is your character and what do they do? Um, and after that, you a flaw is picked for you. <laughs> that might seem strange, but what we do in Heroes and Hardships is we have the GM select the flaw for the player. Now, it's completely up to you. The, the G, there is an optional rule allowing players to choose, but this is so that based on the background that the GM can read from you, and the background doesn't have to be some huge elaborate thing, but like what is your personality? What might be wrong with your character? Um, or what, what are they working on? Um, so that's when you select a flaw. Um, flaws help uh, with you know the role play down the line, and then they give you some, <clears throat> some sort of um, mechanical penalty in certain situations. So I am choosing criminal, which has a very specific effect. So this uh, this person is an assassin, and I've given them the criminal flaw. So uh, that the flaws cost certain things, um, 
and uh, that can give you uh, ancestry traits for free and that sort of thing. But every character gets at least one flaw uh, assigned by the GM. The next thing is your career and currency points. Here I'm going to roll a status check and the status check is going to tell me how many currency points we get. Currency points are a um, kind of an abstraction of money in uh, Heroes and Hardships and we get a nine here. Uh, we don't have very specific um, units of uh, cash or gold or anything like that because we don't know what setting you're going to run. Um, so uh, we actually have everything set in currency points instead of dollars or uh, pounds or euros or some sort of gold, platinum, and whatnot. Um, as well, at this step, you're going to pick your career. We're obviously an assassin. We already did that. Uh, just so you know, careers are basically a narrative example of what your character can do um, and what they might know because there is a care career skill under knowledge for a catch-all. So that's what's that for. There's no like class-based. This is completely classless as a system. Um, and that uh, is pretty much it. Uh, now you're free to go and buy your equipment, and there's hundreds of pieces of weapons and armor and uh, a narrative gear system, which has a uh, uh, an effect on anything you do. It's impossible for us to list all the gear possible in every single s setting. So uh, it also has this abstraction of gear, which um, can do lots of different things. Um, and that is probably uh, just about the end of this video. I've created this character in, in less than 15 minutes while explaining it to you. Uh, now, when you create your first characters, the main thing you're going to do is be looking at the many, many, many options that are available to you. Whereas uh, I still have to do this myself and others that have played tested this system a lot. But all the other parts of character creation are extremely simple and take very little time to do. Um, if you know what you want uh, as far as your abilities and ancestry, uh, ancestry traits, then this process goes very quickly. Um, it's the only thing that takes a little bit of time is understanding what you want to what you want to do. The many many options that are available to you to make this character creation system very deep, very very deep, and so you can create the character that you want. There's no limitations, uh, very little. Um, and so that is what we have today. And I really thank you for watching this video and I hope you get an idea of how character creation works with Heroes and Hardships. And please back and support us. Uh, this project means the world to us. We've been working on it for a long time and uh, we think you will really love it. Um, thank you so much for your time. Hello potential backers and friends, this is Jason Duff with Heroes and Hardships talking about combat. I wanted to run through a uh, combat scenario with you uh, just so you can get an idea of how it works. And uh, I think this is a good opportunity to go through that and uh, show you exactly um, how it works in a fairly simple scenario. Here I have our two um, protagonists, Sir John and Sir Jane against the bad guy. Uh, aptly named and uh, let's get started you see on the um, left side here this is roll 20 uh, easy to uh, show you this way uh, if you look at uh, Sir Jane Sir John and bad guy under turn order uh, here uh, you will see um, a 0 0.22 0 0.7 0 0.16 what does that mean so this is presuming I rolled initiative already um, Initiative is a um, really uh, interesting thing in Heroes and Hardships. The, uh, the initiative this rolled like a normal game as you roll some stat and you get some number and that the highest number goes first. We do that, but it gets a little deeper than that. Um, so in this case, Sir Jane rolled a 22. Uh, this would be a... Um, uh, a senses um, reactions skill check and so she got a 22 Sir John got a 17 and the bad guy got a 16 well what's a zero well this is really the most interesting thing about heroes and hardships and that's the action point system 
The action point system is a way to track actions and movement and how long those actions take uh, without having rounds. There's no rounds in Heroes and Hardships at all. Uh, instead, you will use um, action points and each action you do costs a certain amount of action points. When you use that, you move along the combat track. Um, whoever is highest on the combat track goes last. Whoever, whoever is the lowest on the combat track goes first. So if you spend uh, your action points, or not your uh, any action points, on things that are uh, lower, quicker actions, then you're going to go more. Uh, people who use very uh, high action point um, actions, uh, very long techniques, uh, that is going to take longer and you're going to be slower and you're going to act less. So in combat, it is um, imperative to understand where you are on the combat track and when you're going to act and how fast you're going to act compared to someone else. Okay, and we'll see that as we go along. So the first person to act is Sir Jane. And she is... Uh, has her bow out already we'll presume and she's going to make a shot at the bad guy uh, and she rolls a 22 this is a bow's dexterity skill check and we figure the hit location and we check what the digit is on the right most uh, the right most digit of your roll and a two is an arm okay that is a right arm hit there is a hit location table that you will see in the game uh, and it shows you exactly what numbers correlate to what body part. A standard attack like this is 3 AP. So I will take Sir Jane and move her up the combat track to 3, uh, which means she is now the lowest on the combat track and she is uh, would be the last one to act. Um, so let's see if this hit. So she re rolled a 22. Uh, the next thing we need to do is figure out what the distance is between her and her target. And we're doing in hexes here. So she is six hexes away from the bad guy. Her bow's range is six. And I'm not going to go into exactly how you calculate uh, range penalties and such, but just know that six, um, that, that hex range for her is medium range. And medium range is two range dice. Um, and range dice are penalty dice that when you roll, um, increase the difficulty of your attack. Penalty dice can explode, so it can make hitting difficult. In a ranged attack, you add those penalty dice to the base defense of the target, which would be the bad guy. The bad guy's base defense is 12, and she uh, the, the ranged dice are rolled, and there's a 6 and a 7. So what we're going to do is we're going to add 12 to 13 which is a 25, okay? 25 is the defensive value of this attack. It's called the total defense value, TDV. The base defense value is her attack of 22. You always subtract the base defense value from the base attack value. If that number is negative, then the attack has missed. So we are going to subtract 25 from 22, which is negative 3. Therefore, the attack missed. The next act is Sir John. And Sir John is six hexes away from the bad guy. Um, Sir John has only melee weapons. He has those melee weapons out. And so he needs to get to the bad guy. Um, the way movement works, it's an action like anything else. He could walk, but you can only spend up to 5 AP in a turn. So he chooses a different action called run. 
Run allows you to run a multiple of your speed score. So typically with a speed score one, you would run up to double your speed score um, for the action points you spend. So if I spend five action points and I run, I can move 10 hexes. Um, so he has a speed score of one and he's six away. So I spend three action points to move six hexes with a run. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, Sir John has closed the distance and is now next to the bad guy. So um, running for that many is half the hexes you move. So Sir John now has three AP spent. Running does inflict a penalty to attacks and other people's attacks against you. So if you run, you suffer a pre-roll modifier of a negative three and any attacks to you also get a negative three modifier. All that happens until you act again. So I'll just mark that with a pink dot so we know he ran his last turn. The bad guy's turn finally and he decides to attack. Uh, he's going to just do a normal attack for 3 AP, so what I'm going to do is update the turn tracker for his 3 AP. Now everybody has 3 AP. Now let's uh, finish his attack. He is going to roll his um, sword skill, which is sword and dexterity, um, for a sword skill check. As you can see in the box, he rolls a 20. Uh, his 20 uh, is his base attack value. Um, however, he needs to subtract three from that value because Sir John was running, um, which inflicts a penalty on attacks against him and his attacks against others. So his total is a 17. Now, Sir John gets to make a defensive action, which are out of turn actions. They always are. Um, so Sir John needs to decide what to do. The first thing he considers is his base defense. His base defense is 10. So his base defense is lower than the attack value of 17. Therefore, he would be hit if he just uses base defense. You can use your base defense if your base defense is higher than the attacker's result or it is low enough for the attacker's result that you do not in, uh, suffer uh, damage or not much damage. So uh, Sir John knows he should not use his base defense because that's going to be seven levels of success. That would be his 10 minus 7 or I'm sorry 17 minus 10 so that would be 7 so he doesn't want to do that so he is going to actually use a defensive action to block or do something else for this uh, for this attack Sir John decides to actually block with his shield so he makes a skill check based on shields dexterity shields are um, that skill check so he makes that skill check and he ends up rolling a 17. However, shields do give a pre-roll modifier in their defense um, and plus two in this case. So he would have a 19 instead of a 17. 19 is higher than the 17 attack, so he is able to block the attack. Defensive actions do cost AP. So a block action costs one AP. So Sir John is going to go up in AP. So if you're surrounded or being attacked a lot of, lot of people and you use active defenses, you're going to slow yourself in the combat. So now we have two combatants with the same AP score. They're the same on the combat track. How do we break ties? Well, we break break ties by initiative. So Sir Jane has an initiative of 22 and the bad guy has an initiative of 16. Therefore, Sir Jane goes first. 
Sir Jane once again decides to attack with a standard attack. Not wanting to spend AP on any other action, she simply draws and shoots. Bows are a weapon that have the quality no reload, which does not force you to do any reload actions with those weapons. It's all incorporated in the action itself. So she shoots um, with AP3, and I'll add that to her total, and that brings her up to 6 AP. And as you see, she rolled a 29. She must have had some exploding dice in there. So she hits, the, well, she doesn't necessarily hit the bad guy. Um, now we need to check out the range band. She's still six away. We know that that's medium range, and we know that is two range dice. The bad guy is base defense is 12, which we'll have to take that into effect too. Remember, it's 12 plus the two range dice. Here, I've rolled the two dice, a five and a six for an 11. So the range dice total is an 11, and then we add the bad guy's base defense of 12 for a total of 23. Sir Jane's attack was a 29. So if we subtract 23, we get a six, and that's a hit. The rightmost digit of her base attack value was a nine. So that hits the bad guy in the leg. Now that we know that the blow is hit and where it hit, the first thing we do is look at the weapon damage on Sir Jane's bow, and that's a three. So we add that three to the levels of success, which was six. So now we have a total of nine. Unfortunately, Sir Jane hit the bad guy in the leg. When you're hit in the legs or the arms, you automatically reduce the damage by three. So now she's back down to six. The bad guy doesn't have any armor on his legs, so we're a total of six for the total success value. The next thing we do is we compare the total success value to a few characteristics on the bad guy. The first is his wound level. If the total success value is greater than his wound level, he takes a wound. In this case, his wound level is 10, so he doesn't take a wound. The other thing that we look at is his injury level. Injury levels are half the wound level rounded down. So in this case, his injury level is five. A total success value of six is one greater than the five, so he takes an injury. Injuries give the injured a negative three pre-roll modifier for the rest of the combat. Injuries aren't as damaging as wounds, and they disappear after combat is over. Remember, pre-roll modifiers affect the roll before anything is hit, so it directly impacts being hit or not, not necessarily the damage afterwards. We'll re represent an injury on the bad guy by doing this, using a bubble with a one. If we look at the combat track, the lowest person on the combat track is the bad guy with three, so he goes next. He decides to make a standard attack against Sir John. So we're going to add three to his action point score, bringing him up to six. The bad guy makes a swords attack against Sir John. However, he rolls a 15. 15 is now updated because of his injury for negative three. That brings him to 12. Sir John is still has the effects of running his last turn. So that's a negative three again for nine. So the bad guy's total base success value is currently nine. Now Sir John determines if he needs to perform an active defense. He looks at his base defense, which is 10. Since the bad guy's attack was only nine and it doesn't meet 10 or go over 10, then he does not have to actively defend. 
the tech just misses automatically. This helps save Sir John's AP to use later. Sir John looks at the AP and he has four AP. This is where it's important to understand all the AP at the table, which should always be shown to everyone at all times. AP is never hidden. Sir John sees that the bad guy has AP of six. Therefore, he wonders if there is something he can do between the time he would attack at six and his current AP of four. Luckily, he knows about the aim action. The aim action cost one through five AP you choose. He chooses the one AP version and gives himself one benefit on his next attack versus the bad guy. A benefit increases your rolled dice by one. Since he aimed, I'm going to increase his AP by one. To mark his aim, we'll use a blue dot. Since he made another action, his run benefits and penalties go away. He's no longer suffering the effects of running. Sir John now attacks using a standard attack. It brings his AP up to eight. Realize when you go from a lower AP to APs higher than other people in the combat, they typically do not get to interrupt you. There's only very certain and specific instances with the interrupt action where that can occur. Now, Sir John makes his sword skill check. He's going to add another rolled dice because of the benefit from aiming. As you see, he made a good attack and rolled a 32. That's a pretty high roll. Now we can remove his bubble from aiming. He no longer has any pre-roll modifiers from running or he is not injured. So 32 is what it's going to be. The bad guy knows he's in trouble, so he tries to make a dodge roll to get out of the way. Dodges cost 1 AP and is a defensive action. So we're going to increase his AP by 1. Now he's at 7. The bad guy rolled a 20 on his dodge, but he needs to do a negative 3 to that 20 because he's injured. So now he's actually at 17. Now, you will subtract 17 from 32. 32 was Sir John's attack and 17 was the bad guy's total defensive value. And now we get a total of 15. Now that we have a successful hit with 15 levels of success, we add the damage to Sir John's weapon, which is four, which that brings us to a total success value of 19. The 32 that he rolled earlier is an arm hit, so unfortunately we have to subtract three. That brings us down to 16 for a total success value. But now, as we did earlier, we have to compare the attack to the bad guy's wound level and potentially injury level. His wound level is 10, and 16 is higher than 10, so he takes a wound. If the attack was double the bad guy's wound level, or in this case a 20, it would be a mortality threshold. If attack is higher than a mortality threshold, the defender needs to make a death roll immediately. Since the bad guy took a wound, the first thing we're going to do is mark a permanent wound for the bad guy. This is more important for player characters, but sometimes the GM might do it for NPCs as well. Wounds can last forever and can get converted into permanent penalties to attributes if healing goes awry. If this was a PC, I would mark it down the bad guy has a 16 levels of success wound to his arm. The character sheets on roll 20 do have this option for you to put this information in, so it's very handy to keep track of. For the rest of the combat, besides having a permanent wound, there's something called a wound hardship. Wound hardships are penalty dice that affect the bad guy through the rest of the combat. 
This will increase his difficulty by one penalty dice, a d10 that explodes. To mark this, I'll give him a red bubble with a 1. Simulating shock and awe and the loss of blood is important in Heroes and Hardships. It does this and it also helps for combats not to uh, last overly long and get bogged down. So the next thing the bad guy has to do is make a falter roll. Anytime you take a wound, you usually take a falter roll as well. Falter rolls are stamina skill checks with all penalties, whereas death rolls have no penalties in included. So, if you have wounds and injuries and you make a death roll, they do not affect your roll. However, if you make a falter roll, any wounds or injuries always affect the roll and increases the difficulty. The target numbers of death rolls and falter rolls is always the levels of success of the wound that was bestowed upon you. The Naga makes a stamina roll and gets a 21. However, he must subtract 3 right away for his injury, bringing him to 18. He then makes a wound hardship roll, which is included in the difficulty, and he only gets a 1. He's very lucky. That brings him to 17. The original total success value was a 16. So he's just made it just barely and stays afloat. Death rolls and falter rolls do not cause AP spins. They're just what happens when you get injured. Looking at the combat track, now that that combat is resolved, Sir Jane is up next. Sir Jane seeing that she has some time, aims once. We'll mark that with a blue bubble on Sir Jane and increase her AP by one. This brings her into a tie with the bad guy, but her AP is higher, so she's going to go first. Sir Jane continues to use a standard attack for only three AP, but this time she's going to add a benefit to her attack from her aim. This should give her a better chance of landing a very solid blow on the bad guy, who is already injured. We'll add 3 to her APs. That brings her to 10, and we'll remove her aim. Now we'll make her attack. She makes a good roll of a 30 with that benefit. Now she needs to roll 2 range dice because she's still in medium range, and add that to the bad guy's base defense. Lucky for Sir Jane, only a 5 was rolled on the two range dice. You would add that to his base defense of 12, so that's a total of 17. Now, we're going to subtract the 17 from the 30, giving Sir Jane 7. Going to subtract 17 from 30, which equals 13. Now, we're going to add Ganji's. Now, we're going to add Sir Jane's damage on her bow, which is 3. Her attack was a 30, so the zero on the rightmost digit is a headshot. That increases the damage by 5. That gives her a total success value of 21. 21 is higher than the bad guy's mortality threshold. He has no armor. If it's higher than his mortality threshold, which is double his wound level, he instantly makes a death roll like we talked about before. Death rolls are resilient skill checks. And, as I mentioned before, they do not incur penalties from wound hardships or injuries. And the baseline rule is to add a wound level to the roll. So, the bad guy will make a resilience roll and add his wound level. His target number is the total success value of the attack. The bad guy makes a roll and only gets a total of 19, even with the plus 10 from his wound level. The original damage was 21, so that's lower than his death roll. That means he dies immediately. Sir John and Sir Jane have won the day, and this is a basic combat in Heroes and Hardships. I hope it was helpful to you, and I wish you a good day. Thank you.
Hello, potential backers and friends. This is Jason Duff with Earl of Five Games uh, here to talk about Heroes and Hardships, most specifically the magic system of Heroes and Hardships. And I wanted to give you just a, a rundown of how that worked. All right. Here I have a PL1 Sorcerer. Um, now, sorcerers are built for one type of specific magic, which is uh, traditional magic, and we'll talk about the differences between traditional magic and superpowers uh, now. So there are two different tightly coupled magic systems, if you will, um, that work almost exactly the same way. If you've watched the combat video before this, basically the way uh, it works is... Traditional magic works more like ranged combat, and powers work more like melee combat. Um, so, um, let's let's get started. So, what what happens here is um, when you build your character or a NPC or an adversary, um, the first thing they need is they need to be able to cast spells, and so uh, most characters need um, either. Um, the superpowers or magic abilities that allow them to unlock spells and powers. Um, we call what you would normally consider a spell a manifestation. And manifestations are um, can be built in certain ways uh, by powers and traditional magic. So traditional magic would uh, cast a spell and superpowers would activate a power. That's kind of the vernacular of the system. Um, what happens is you have an ability that is your manifestation as a power or as a spell and they do work differently and they do have different costs. Spells are always, uh, they always cost four ability points and powers are variable in cost based on what you do with the manifestation. So each manifestation has certain levels to it. Um, they have different categories such as potency, duration, targets, uh, range, things like that. And some manifestations based on what that manifestation is, those things can be altered. Let's say range for instance. Uh, if you have the manifestation energy attack um, the base is touch for your um, range so that's your level one uh, manifestation um, is just touch and now you can increase it to make it two hexes four hexes six hexes eight hexes that sort of thing and every increment of two is another level for it um, so that's how you would change that now now spells do this on the fly and powers you buy those in actual uh, character creation or by doing advancement so that's kind of the overview um, so uh, let's do a traditional magic uh, casting here so you see how it works and that's easy for the sorcerer because that's what he is set up to do but it shouldn't take much for me to show both um, he has uh, the ability uh, magic user so he can cast um, magic spells um, that means he can purchase the spells now what spells that he has so far is energy attack and tempest okay those are two spells I'm not going to go into the details of each but uh, those are the two spells he has um, this, uh, these spells are, they come from the uh, Cosmos School, and Cosmos School uses the skill Harness. Um, so as you know before, uh, the Harness is based out of Willpower, so he's going to roll 8 dice, 4 plus 4, and keep the Willpower 4. Um, so that's what he's going to roll, okay? Um, it does say Target, uh, so uh, do you want to benefit? No. Pullback? No. Additional Mods? No. Hardships, no. We're just doing this very simply. Um, typically, you will target. Um, this is if you're casting at, at a target that can resist. Um, so you would say yes. This is just um, the uh, roll 20. Um, now, spell effects. This is where it gets interesting. Our magic system is very flexible. So taking the example of energy attack, for instance, let's say 
he uh, wants to hit someone that is not in touch range. That means he has to um, he has to increase the spell levels of his spell to do it, and he can do this on the fly as a as a traditional magic spell. So um, let's say they are two hexes away. So um, when er all the options that you can raise are baseline, that's a level one spell. Um, so uh, one spell effect. Um, if you're increasing it, uh, for each one you increase, that's two, uh, or for each one is another spell effect. So if he's two hexes away, he's going to increase it to um, to two spell effects. If he's, you know, uh, four, then he's going to have to do three spell effects and so on. This is an example. There's other things that can happen with energy attack, for instance. The potency, how much damage it does can be increased. You can hit multiple targets at once. That's, for instance, with a spell. And each spell is different. Each manifestation is different. So um, some manifestations uh, you can't increase potency, some you can, and some are different options based on what it is, right? It's contextual based on what the manifestation is. So, for instance, uh, let's say he's going to do uh, just the two spell effects, so he's going to hit someone from two hexes or units away, and then we roll. Okay, so he would roll an eight. Okay, I'm going to hover over the roll so you can get an idea here. <clears throat> So the first thing uh, is his roll, and he rolled 18, 6, 13, 3. Uh, those are the dice that he rolled, and the 18 and the 13 obviously are explosions on that roll. Um, so that total, and then we subtract 12. Well, what is the 12? Well, in the traditional magic system, you subtract the magic defense of the target. So this is this is the same as range defense. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in range combat versus uh, base defense, because you always do this in range combat as well. And then you subtract the 13 and the seven. Well, the 13 and the seven are actually what's called spell dice, and spell dice um, they uh, are uh, a variable difficulty that happens based on what level your spell is. You're always going to have that first level, um, so you're always going to roll one of them, um, but the more and more you stack like to make your spell more um, effective, uh, the d more difficult it is. And so 13 plus 7, you know, all that together, the total is 8 here. So if your total is positive after you do this, then you actually hit your target. And so you hit your target, and that's your that would be classified as your you know your base success value, just like an attack would in combat. So that would be eight in this case. And then you would add any um, post rule modifiers, where in this case would be your damage. Since he didn't boost energy energy attacks damage, which happens to be five, he would hit the defender for a total of uh, thirteen damage. Okay, so they would take 13, um, 13 other damage in this case. Um, so that's that's how that works. Um, as a defender, just like in ranged combat, you don't actually, uh, well, you don't get to actually uh, actively defend. And that's the difference between uh, traditional magic and superpowers, where in superpowers you actually do. So let's look at superpowers. So superpowers encompass what you would think of superpowers, kind of innate um, powers that come from your being of what you are. Now this could be this could be because you are a superhero or you could uh, get those for some reason. Let's say you're an elf and you have an affinity for na nature magic or something like that, right? Um, so there's two ways to get these types of um, manifestations, which are called powers. Um, one is you buy the ability superpowers which lets you unlock um, powers uh, which you buy with experience points or ability points um, or in this case there are some ancestry traits that allow you to um, also purchase powers um, uh, which would come from your ancestry like you know like I said elven affinity to magic or dwarven affinity to you know magic as well things like that so you can do that as well. I'm not going to talk too much about how ancestry traits work, but 
um, when you cat when you activate the the power, they all work the same. So when you buy a power, unlike a spell, when you buy a spell, it just costs four ability points or um, you know twenty experience points uh, usually. Uh, a power is a little different. Power is variable in the cost because unlike a spell, they aren't flexible. A spell, you can change the, the effects quite rapidly um, with um, increasing uh, valid effect levels like uh, your range or your duration or whatever it might be. Uh, powers, you cannot do that on the fly. You have to purchase your maximum um, your maximums on those valid effects. So, for instance, if we use energy attack like we were talking about earlier, I would pay the base of four to just get energy attack at one. Uh, and when I say at one, that means at spell level one, which all of your um, valid effects are at the first level. So, if all of your effects are at first level, so you get all those automatically, like your range would be touch, for instance, if we're using touch, uh, that example. So, if I wanted to... Um, increase that range, I would pay for it in character creation or with experience points. Um, and that increases the cost of the power uh, above the, the flat rate. So if you take, um, for instance, uh, you want a range of two, so you're, you're buying a, a second level uh, power on that uh, range um, category and so that costs more at the beginning and so when you're in play you can you can activate that power and hit people from uh you know at a at a maximum of two uh hexes or units away uh or or you know um inside that range too but uh, that's the maximum you can do you cannot change it on the fly so what's different well when you're when you're actually using magic, the difference is um, you still roll the same dice. Um, the difference is each manifestation has a active resistance, um, or they sh they might have an active resistance if it's a targeted spell. If if it's something you like, you know, you're healing yourself, it might not have an active resistance. But if somebody is defending, um, or you have a target of an unwilling person which is a better way to say it say it they there's an active resistance so on energy attack I believe it's dodge so um, instead of using a combination of spell dice and magic defense you use um, your active defense which is dodge so the defender gets to roll a dodge roll um, now just like in melee combat you can default to your magic defense so if the attack isn't as high as your magic defense, then there's no reason to actually um, defend. Um, active defenses against manifestations are uh, free actions, uh, un unlike uh, combat actions, which are usually uh, cost uh, some sort of AP cost, like dodge cost one AP. Um, but not not in magic. Those are just kind of innate things that you do immediately. And that's the difference. So there's no there's no spell dice involved in uh, the power system. Um, so uh, they work almost the exact same, but there's just a, a bit of a nuance uh, there between the two. And one character can have both, right? It's, it's very possible for a character to say, have uh, to be a wizard and have traditional magic and also have like an ancestry trait that gives them powers or both superpowers and magic. Um, there might be reasons you would want to do that. Um, so you can combine the two. There's no, there's no reason not to. Um, and the, the last thing, and that, and that, so those are how those two things work. And the last thing I want to talk about is the concept of surges, which you might consider critical failures. So there's, there's a stat called fate. That's a, that's an attribute. Okay. Um, and in games that use fate, obviously, if, if you have a magic setting, um, you have to use the fate because it is important um, for magic. Um, it's magic specific uses comes from the focus skill. Um, the focus skill is the only skill under fate. The focus skill uh, does a couple things. Number one, it 
um, tells you how many uh, powers or spells you can have total. Um, so it's uh, your focus skill multiplied by four. So that's the total uh, of the um, amount you can have. So, so if I'm a wizard and I have focus of two, like like this guy, I can have up to eight spells, um, which is plenty. Um, but you can't have more. Um, so uh, having focus is good for that. Um, but the main thing is is to avoid surges. And so what's a surge? Well, you can surge in uh, superpowers and traditional magic. It's harder to surge with a superpower, and here's why. Uh, when you roll your dice, if we look at this harness roll before, um, he has two dice that exploded. Okay, so the 18 and the 13 are the product of an ex are both products of two explosions. Okay, he has two focus. You can have as many explosions on your roll equal to or less than the focus without possibly surging. Um, so if he would have surged a third time with a focus two, he would have been said to surge, um, that, and that's a and that's a critical failure. So the funny thing is, you can you can um, surge if you do too good or if you do too bad. So like I was talking about earlier with traditional magic, you also roll those spell dice, right? The 13 and the seven on this on this list. So there's one uh, explosion there. So you also look at the total of your spell dice. So if you're cranking up the difficulty and you have five spell dice, um, the more likely is that they're gonna explode. So if you also look at the spell dice independently of your skill dice, you have, um, if you have more, sur more explosions than your focus, you're also said to surge, okay? So there's two ways you can surge with traditional magic. Now powers, on the other hand, is more difficult to surge because you don't have spell dice. So you can't surge on the difficulty, you can only surge on the skill roll. So that's, that's different. So what happens if you do surge? Well. If you do surge, and let's say you got this eight, and you surge somehow with an eight, which is possible, um, with all the all the negatives, um, you need to make a focus skill check that is greater than your total um, or the total of your spell dice to avoid surging. Okay, so for instance, if I rolled, um, if I rolled the eight, uh, and I, I surged on that. Uh, I would need to beat an eight um, on my focus roll or not surge. Okay, if I if I if I succeed, nothing happens. If I fail, then I see how much uh, there's there's a chart basically that says, okay, you fell by this amount, and if you spell, fell by this amount, this is what you roll. This and this this is where we get into heroes and hardships. All the subsystems are very similar. They work they work very. The, the same way to do the same thing. So now this comes into how wounds work exactly. So you look at a chart, you say, how much did I surge or how much was I wounded and how impactful this is gonna be. And so you roll on, a, on, a, on the surge table, um, you roll um, 3d10 and you want to get higher. And then um, the better you did on your surge roll, um, the less or the more die you put into the roll. So so it's, a, it's possible you're gonna roll 5d10 on a chart with 23, um, 23 options. And so you're trying to get high. And then if you get 23 or above, nothing happens, right? And then there's, if you roll low or you have a severe surge, right? And, and you are only rolling 3d10, you know, you're likely to roll lower and then that's where the really bad things happen on the on the surge tables, and um, so, and when I say really bad things, I mean potentially horrific things. Like you can evaporate evaporate and just explode, right? If you roll like a three, um, so and and you can do things to uh, mitigate that. There's optional rules where you don't have to roll. Uh, the surge tables don't exist, um, or uh, you add. Uh, extra dice to the surge table um, when you roll on it. 
um, that sort of thing if you want your uh, magic uh, easier to cast and less deadly. But, you know, uh, our our ideal of magic is for a deadly system out of the out of the box. But it's easy easily tinkered to the style you want to play, which which is pretty much Heroes and Hardships in a nutshell. Uh, if you want it less deadly, you can easily get rid of the whole entire surge uh, table and... Uh, it's not going to affect you one way or another um, if you don't want like magic to actually have backfires, severe backfires, or if you want some p a possibility, um, but you don't want the absolute worst things. You can just add a dice to it or two dice to it, and then you'll never get the absolute worst, um, the worst uh, results. So um, that is how magic works in a nutshell. Uh, I know there's a lot of information there, and I've went through it the best I can just explaining it here. Um, but uh, yeah, just to recap, there are two different uh, magic systems very closely coupled together. One is for traditional magic. One is for superpowers. Uh, they work very similarly, as I said, um, with some uh, very specific details for um uh, a flexible system, which would be the traditional magic, versus inflexible system, which is the powers, um, with uh, less dangerous being the powers and more dangerous being traditional magic, uh, and a difficulty where powers are typically less difficult and um, magic is more difficult. And the last thing would be that the powers can be actively defended by a defender or a target, and traditional magic is not actively defended. It is more um, kind of uh, how good you are at casting it um, versus uh, their static magic defense. So uh, that is uh, magic for Heroes and Hardships. I thank you for watching, and I hope you back and uh, follow it along, and um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much.